digitize uh, that this vast environment into a single uh, paper, right? Um, so feel free to have a look. I won't have time to go in detail through everything because it's huge, but I'll try to focus more on the scala aspects of it. And uh, hopefully at the end, we'll have some time to, to have Q&A and you can ask me any questions uh, uh, regarding any of the technologies or frameworks or even the process, which is uh, uh, quite uh, different from building other types of software, like regular Java applications and so on. So basically, I'm going to talk really quick about me, the introductions, and then we'll go through the whole recipe. And at the end, I will um, talk a bit uh, about this, the Scala aspect of this and, and the role of the Scala as a language within the big data world, right? Uh, for, for me, I, I mean, it's, it's in the view, so I, I have pl plenty of industry experience. Um, and uh, I've been focusing the last year a lot on big data. Uh, machine learning and DevOps, uh, but I'm also have a full stack developer, front end, back end, and uh, I'm certified in whole four or five AWS certifications, Google Cloud, and also Kubernetes. So um, I'm also into the Dev, DevOps, uh, DevOps world. And, uh, and the only cloud I'm not too familiar, so if anybody has input, it's Azure from Microsoft. Um, but at the end, all the clouds are quite similar. I'm active for writerimedia.com and in publications like Towards Data Science, you see articles of mine there. And you have also the links there on the bottom to, to feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, I'm quite active on the community. Again, I already talked that's based on that article. You have the link there and it's a high level overview. And um, the goal is to focus mainly on the open source solutions. Uh, that can be deployed on-prem, right? Because each cloud provider has its own solutions and we could spend a lot of time going through all the cloud providers. So this, uh, I will mention cloud, but only slightly. I will focus on on-prem open source uh, software. There's also a lot of uh, uh, software that is um, paid and not on-prem, so I, I won't talk too much about it. Okay. So I, first, I'm going to go really quick to, uh, with uh, the main considerations that you need uh, the, uh, to uh, wait uh, when dealing with the big data. It's a different world uh, from normal software development. Uh, the first thing is you have to really know your data, uh, the volume, uh, the variety, the velocity, uh, and all the security aspects, right? So uh, considering this, uh, uh, um, basically attributes of the data, whether you are focusing more on static patch or dynamic data, hot versus cold. Hot data, it means you really need to make decisions in real time or you are more into the batch processing, the data flow, and also that those bounded context between data. Again, the um, domain different design is very popular within uh, big data because it helps you to set boundaries and uh, governance on the data. So this is very important. Other considerations is the typical SQL versus no SQL. And I'm not gonna get too much into this. Uh, and uh, for me, the most important difference that people are not really talking about when they compare uh, SQL versus NoSQL is basically the way you model data. In the NoSQL world, you model your queries. You need to know your clients in advance. And this is very important for big data, especially if you want to create a, a reporting layer that if you put into a NoSQL database, it's, it's not flexible, right? So keep that in mind where in the SQL world, you, you model your data, right? Not your queries. That's why you have SQL. Another thing that you need to consider is, is the OLTP world versus OLAP. Uh, I put there some attributes. So if, uh, just, um, if you hear some of this terminology, it kind of brings you closer to o o OLTP. OLT OLTP is online transactions. So you are talking about interacti interactive processing, transactional, uh, you know, asset transactions, real time, hot data, like um, uh, request response, high availability, low latency. So this is kind of, uh, the world you're talking about, regular applications, and all of world is more for analytics, big data, batch processing, business analysts, a lot of high throughput reporting, ad hoc queries, so data warehouse, data lake, and so on. This is kind of the topic of big data, right? Um, and then within all of you have data warehouses and data lake, right? A data warehouse, you think more of relational data, the star schema, very structured. You have to scale mainly vertically, uh, tend to be more uh, 
costly than data lakes and data lakes are more the commodity hardware you think about hadoop hdfs low cost and you can have also some structured data in this talk i'm going to mention a lot bit, uh, the thing between hadoop and no hadoop this is a basically a, a topic of its own and uh, different people have opinions that hadoop is already dead uh, others said that, that that is not. Um, I mentioned a bit on the article, but here I, I try to, when I mention as a technology, I will say uh, if it's uh, based on the Hadoop environment or not. Kubernetes is taking over, and especially on cloud providers, serverless analytic solutions like AWS Glue, uh, Athena, and things like that uh, allow you to build data pipelines and, and reporting uh, without using Hadoop, right? So, um, just consider that, especially when you consider the cloud, that Hadoop is, is basically more using on-prem solutions. Another thing to consider is the velocity, real-time versus batch. Again, uh, real-time provides more value, but it's more difficult. Uh, the four generations of engines, like we'll talk later, like Apache Flink and the Spark, uh, the new versions of Spark, and especially Apache Bean, allow you to treat uh, batch and string in a unified way. Uh, but in general, uh, they are different, and uh, you process a, a bit different um, your data. Another consideration again is if uh, you're running on, on cloud or on-prem, and even on-prem, whether you go, want to go cloud native, like using containers or using VMs or bare metal, the way you set up Hadoop is different. So consider that. And also we talk about several solutions that uh, it's out of the scope, but something you really need to consider when if you are running on the cloud. Another thing that you need to think about, I mean, these are all aspects that you, you need to, to think before even thinking about uh, data pipeline. So the other thing is CTL versus ELT. Uh, you know, data warehouse is ETL, uh, says they tend to require a fixed schema. So you process all the data and you have the rate to be query. So transformation aggregations uh, on read are slower. Um, but provide more, more flexibility. So the, the idea is, um, uh, that you do all the uh, joins and aggregations and you present the data ready to be query and that's ETL, so you transform first uh, or uh, you leave it that for later. That's the whole idea of um, let the query do all the aggregations. And for me, it's super important the thing is structure and methodology, like company policies, organizations, and the, the way you build software or for data pipeline, you don't build like a Java application and then you handle to support and leave it for five years. Data is always changing, right? So uh, that's super important that you don't build software. The software life, life cycle development is completely different for data pipelines, for big data. Uh, you don't have like um, uh, Python developers, Scala developers, BAs. No, you have diff completely different. You have data sciences, data engineers. Uh, you don't have a D um, DBAs. You have basically a data engineer that knows all the all the different storage options. So again, it's, it's a different set of skills, uh, and and, uh, and basically you are probably looking for. Uh, uh, more cross-functional teams, right, in your organization. So if you have really fixed uh, all the style of organization, uh, moving to big data could be a real challenge without changing your organization mindset. So let, let's start building the, the pipeline. So keep all these things that we talked in mind, all these things to consider. And now let's first check what we need. The first thing is we need the storage. You, you have the uh, append logs, file systems, uh, Hadoop databases, which are on top of file systems, and what I call massive DBs that are built for big data. Uh, for real-time ingestions, uh, there are tools like Kafka or Pulsar. Pulsar is actually an alternative that I really, really like uh, uh, to Kafka, right? So please check it out uh, if you're starting a new project uh, because it has some advantages over Kafka. But what they do compared uh, to uh, any other messaging platform like a, a service bus is that provide persistence. So they, you have that uh, pen only log. So Kafka, you don't treat it like a messaging system. It's more like a storage as well. And you can do things like uh, event sourcing and so on. So uh, again, you, you can publish events to Kafka, and then you uh, store them there, and then you set uh, to read. So it's very good for ingestion, but eventually you'll drop them the file somewhere. So for data lakes, 
data lake think about Hadoop, you have the HDFS file system. And uh, the, the thing is in, in the cloud, again, you tend to replace HDFS for the underlying deep storage that could be S3 in AWS or GCS in, in Google Cloud. Azure has the same thing. Um, the file systems or deep storage systems are cheaper than databases, but they just provide basic storage and not, do not provide other things. Um, in the Hadoop world, you have things like HBase that sit on top of the file system and provide more uh, database uh, on top of that uh, that you can use and it's based on, on big table. Then you have all these databases as a Hadoop, like Cassandra's really popular no, NoSQL database that can uh, basically scale really, really well. Uh, it's great for uh, OLTP, but can be used for all up. I do recommend if you start a new project and you're thinking about Cassandra to check uh, SILADB, which is a replacement, a uh, much better for all up, so type of uh, big data. So check it out, it's, it's, it's Cassandra, same API, but it's rewritten in C, C++, so it's much more efficient, even twice as, uh, or, or more, six times faster and cheaper. Uh, Jugabyte DB is, is another uh, new type of new database uh, that tends to compete with Google Spanner. Google Spanner is the only database that could, um, uh, it's completely relational, so you have the asset guarantee, uh, guarantees. It was developed by Google by using atomic clocks and all this fancy stuff. It's the only relational database that can um, uh, scale horizontally. And Yugabyte DB also achieved that. It's the only open source outside Google Cloud. Uh, AWS doesn't have this capability of, of having a global distributed relational database. Uh, Yugabyte provides that uh, if you are not on Google Cloud. And then you have MongoDB, InfluxDB, Prometheus. Elasticsearch is an amazing tool uh, used for virtually all types of things from analytics to log aggregations to invert index. So also to consider and can, all these databases can scale uh, and store massive amount of data. Uh, and again, if you go uh, into a file system like S3 or HDFS, then you have to think about the file format. This is uh, very important. Uh, also consider about your, how you partition your data. It's very, very important as well uh, to not uh, scan too much data on this, right? So par data partition that is outside of this topic because it's, it's a topic of its own and uh, data formats are both really, really important. And what you should consider for data formats is the structure of your data. Some handle better nested data than others. Uh, I do recommend Avro for a raw level format. The performance, you'll see lots of com comparisons, but basically binary formats, they always outperform JSON or CSV. So in your big data pipeline, use Avro, Parquet or ORC um, for, for your um, processing. Uh, but again, the JSON or CSV are much easier to read, human readable. Also think about compression and the schema evolution. The schema evolution uh, dif differs from different formats. Uh, Avro has a, re a much better schema evolution than Parquet, for example. And the compatibility. Again, if you want to be compatible, use JSON, right? So that's the summary. JSON uh, and CSV are human readable, easy to use, but like many of the capabilities, they are not efficient at all. Spark really struggled with nested JSON, not really recommended. Uh, and so I do recommend during the ingestion, convert JSON to a more uh, optimized format like uh, um, Avro or Parquet. Avro, um, I use it for um, row level operations. So for the initial data normalization, cleans cleansing and so on, use Avro uh, because it has a really good schema evolution to check for validate your data. And it's also super fast, it has file splitting and integrates really well with Kafka if you use it for ingestion, right? And a parquet is very good uh, because it's columnar based for the, your final reporting layer because then you can only read the data that you need based on your query. So we'll talk more about this later. And also you need to, to consider the different compress uh, um, algorithms as well. Then again, consider the infrastructure, whether you run Kubernetes or Apache Mesos or in the cloud. Again, I won't go uh, too much on the cloud. The type of hardware that you have, for example, Cassandra requires really, um, really heavy, good hardware, fast SSD, where HDFS um, can run in, in any commodity hardware uh, and, and things like that. 
So also consider monitor alerting. Again, when you do your big data pipeline, this is much harder than software. So make sure you have good monitoring. You have Prometheus and Grafana. For Scala, you can use Camo as a library that can connect to all of these. Uh, use log aggregation. One thing that's very important uh, when dealing with the data pipelines is data lineage. So make sure you record how you transform your data, especially for regulatory projects in financial institutions. You need to track how you change your data. So consider that from the beginning because then it's very hard. There are tools like Apache Atlas uh, that are, are built for that. And other tools like Apache NIFA that we'll discuss this, this uh, later uh, provide that um, as well. And of course, the whole security, right? You need to uh, go, uh, govern uh, your whole data lake. So tools like Apache Ranger uh, allow you to do that. Uh, again, the most important thing for me is the people. Again, I mean, people has a limit on the, on the budget. Uh, so uh, building big data pipelines is complex and uh, it's, uh, the process is quite different, right? So uh, don't use the typical NTR approach to architect the data pipeline. Use more domain-driven design based on business domain capabilities because the data changes with the business, right? It's not like a Java application where you do the database layer, the search layer, and the UI. Don't develop like that. Also, the, the, the people is different. You have data engineers which are cross-functional. They need to know about how to manage a Cassandra cluster and how to manage Hadoop as well, as well as coding, right? Uh, and you need to interact with data scientists and business analysts that uh, um, do most of the business um, intelligence. Okay, so now uh, we have all these ingredients, right? Uh, we talk about all, all these things to consider. So how do you build a data pipeline? The first step is to get the data into the data lake or data warehouse. Uh, get it from, you have all these different legacy systems or coming data from anywhere. So the goal of ingestion is uh, basically get all, all, all the data that you need and store it in raw format. Raw format means you don't want to process the data during ingestion. Again, keep it simple, single responsibility. And uh, of course, there are tools to do that. We'll talk uh, about them, the pull data, uh, but uh, you can also push data, right? And this is the whole thing. Should I pull from API or should I do things like CDC, which is chain data capture? With quite popular tools like Dimension allow you to uh, basically capture events from your legacy system like you have oracle database or mysql database and every time there's an update on that database uh, you get notified into your kafka topic and then that goes into your data lake that allows you to basically migrate from your legacy systems into big data easily right again Kafka or Pulsa is going to be part of your ingestion because it provides back pressure, persistence of messages. So that reliability, uh, monitoring uh, is really, really recommended for your ingestion. So ingest uh, data through Kafka. Ideally, you want these systems to publish to Kafka, either through CDC or another process, right? Again, the goal is to minimize dependencies because ingestion is critical because uh, you're depending on all these systems and uh, data comes from lots of sources and it's the sources that change over time. Uh, so you want to really set that boundary and make sure that all these changes, uh, they don't um, affect the processing layer, the next layer. Okay, for ingestion, we can look at two uh, broad categories. One is what I call a managed solution, that is basically do it yourself, take uh, any library and code yourself, right, pull from APIs, file systems and so on. Um, I'll get into details, like one solution is Apache Camel, which I don't really recommend, but I put there for the uh, Java developers. Uh, also for Scala, it, it, it's, it's not a great a API, but you could just write your own um, Camel applications. And more modern thing that I recommend is using Akka with the Akka strings and Alpaca to pull from APIs, files. Alpaca is an integration library that provides a wide range of connections. So the one familiar with Kafka, think about Kafka Connect. Uh, that's the same thing, but for Scala and Cassandra, you can pull from Cassandra, files, cloud, FTP, DBs, anything that you can think of. Um, you, you should connect with some registry like Afro for, to store metadata. 
and yeah, it's basically high performance and provides a really rich uh, DSL. Um, so it's really good for ingesting data streams. And of course, you have a ACA HTTP, so your uh, ingesting microservice can expose REST interfaces, ACA cluster to, to distribute your lo um, your application, and persistence for event source, event source and SQLRS. So if you do it yourself, you have these unmanaged uh, class uh, libraries that you use to pull data or or in just data, uh, how do you deploy this? Well, one idea of Yusaka is use a monolith. Again, for Scala in particular, um, I'm, I also a Go developer and I love Go for microservices, uh, but the Scala, I tend to prefer more mini services and even go toward a monolith. I'm very uh, a fan of microservices, but for some things, especially when you use ACA, you have ACA cluster to do the distributed and you have Dr. System. So ACA is, is very good to, to do um, deploy as a, as, a, as a monolith, right? Uh, but again, it's, it's very easy to set up, but the problem is difficult to make ch changes, collaborate and so on, the problem of monoliths, right? That's one option. The other option is to use uh, microservices to do your ingestion bit. And here, remember, we are talking just ingestion, we didn't get into processing yet. Um, so with microservices, uh, you have to approach the non-deterministic is actually using Kafka, it's the approach that I suggest. Uh, here you create topics and subscriptions and that create your DAC, basically your dependencies. So you use your topic to orchestrate dependencies. So for example, you said, okay, uh, everything on this topic, who, who, whichever uh, consumes this topic can run in parallel and the next topic uh, will, will create that um, boundary and that dependency. Again, the, uh, because of Kafka provides lots of guarantees, back pressure, retries, redundancy, all these. If you don't have Kafka, uh, you can use more deterministic approach where you have your microservices and some orchestrator that calls and coordinates uh, the ingestion process, especially when there's dependency. Airflow is the most famous uh, tool, but we'll discuss something later. Again, if you deploy your own, again, you have uh, to, to manage yourself. There are tools in the Hadoop framework like uh, that allow you to ingest data uh, with not much configuration. One is a scoop for, it's used for databases and another few more for streaming data like logs. And you can just install these tools and, and do it much easier, but they are very, very limited. So it, to call APIs or things like that, it won't be possible. Another tool that I want to discuss is Apache NiFi. Uh, it's it's a dat data flow management. We'll talk about other data flows like Daxter later. The difference between orchestrator like Airflow that manage uh, task dependencies and a data flow is, is data flow goes beyond. It only it acts like orchestrator, right? Uh, to do certain jobs, but actually tracks the data, right? So Apache Knife supports uh, all these graphs. Uh, they are great for and routing and transformation. So you can do everything with data. So you just think like a, a, a DAC and a pipeline where each step you modify the data and Apache Knife has lineage. It knows how the data evolves, change, and provide lots of things, but it's more like a um, UI drag and drop, not much coding, although you can create your own processors in Scala or Java. Uh, I really recommend these to start with for POCs, but again, uh, it doesn't scale beyond eight, nine nodes. Uh, it's not really for huge, huge amount of data, but for POCs or if your data is not too big, I really consider this because it provides orchestration. You don't need a separate application. It provides data lineage. It provides security, right? It provides lots of things out of the box and a simple UI. Okay, so now uh, we have gotten uh, basically our data, raw data. It's sitting in some storage, like a file system HDFS or S3 or a database. And uh, now we, we need to process it. And uh, here is this step now is becoming more and more optional. Uh, thanks to basically what I call the new OLAP engines that allow you to actually process raw data, well, ingest, not process, uh, ingest data uh, directly into the resistance and query it in real time. And we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, and this is what I was talking about, ELT, ETL, right? This is the processing when you want to perform all, all um, 
basically man, uh, transform all the data to, to be query, right? So to simplify the queries. And here, there's lots of things you can do. You can first you can validate the data, clean the data, normalization, standardization. But then there's more. You can actually do uh, pre-computer aggregations, join the data with different data sets and so on. So the processing bit, it, it can do just a simple step or it becomes really complicated. So that's why I, I, this is the key role of a data engineer. And this is why I like to divide it in three phases, especially for batch. But again, the goal again is to clean, normalize, and, and save it in a well-defined schema, what I call the trusted data set, right? It's your own uh, definition of your data lake. This is my, my data that has been clean and can be queried already. So there, there could be three phases that I, I like to point. One is the pre-processing phase, which is optional. Again, this is what we talked. If your data is JSON, you may transform, want to transform it to Avro. Uh, if it's nested, you want to flatten first. So you can do all this pre-processing if you cannot, um, it, if it cannot be done during ingestion. So it's very common, for example, that ingestion is, is part of another system or another thing. Uh, and they say, well, look, we can only dump this big JSON file, which is very inefficient to um, run with uh, Spark. So in this case, you need that pre-processing phase before running your Spark jobs or, or any other processing. Then is what I call the trusted phase, where you actually perform the ETL, right? And you transform, normalize the data and so on. And the end result is that parquet data lake format, parquet or ORC, whatever format, but it's optimized to be query uh, using SQL, right? Or, or any other clients. The idea is after the trusted phase, you have your data set where you can run queries, you can connect Tableau or any other business intelligence system and so on. So um, in this phase, you may want to also pre-compute some aggregations. So if you have customer and tra transactions, you want to have a table as well. Um, for the transactions per customers and so on. But this is your data set internally for you, for your organization. That's when the reporting phase come in, in, in place because most likely you have downstream systems that, uh, you know, a single schema uh, won't work. So what you will need to do is create this type of views where you may require extra aggregations, you may require to create views on top of your data. The, the idea is to create optimized uh, views for downstream systems. These are called data marts, right? Um, very popular term. Um, so this is basically um, sometimes a subset of the data that uh, is optimized for a particular downstream system, right? Uh, you may want at this point on the reporting phase, take a subset of the data and put it into a fast storage, like a normal SQL database. So you have uh, 500 gigabytes of data and 100 of them for the last day or last week, you put it in, in MySQL. That's what happens during the reporting phase as well, if you want. Uh, again, the, we'll talk later that there's ways around that as well, that you don't have to, to use that. There are engines now that can be, be, be very, very fast uh, and you don't need the both fast and slow storage. So moving, so how you process the data? Apache Spark is the most famous processing engine. I'm not going to get into details. It integrates with Hive to support SQL. It runs on Yarn or Mesos. Kubernetes can run anywhere. It's written in Scala. Um, so this is the, Spark actually really pushed Scala into the mainstream, I think that's my opinion. And it has libraries for machine learning, anything you can think of. And now it has the Spark streaming as well for streaming data, not for batch, uh, really widely used and supported by all cloud providers. Apache Flink is, is uh, newer um, and it, it was basically created to overcome the problems with the Spark to unify batch and streaming and to be able to have a stateful streams of data so you could compute aggregations based on time windows. It's faster than the Spark, it's fully uh, is a stream, right? Uh, meaning that support real time streaming, not like a Spark that uses mini batches and also supports Scala. So I really recommend Apache Flink, it's really, really powerful. Other two options are Apache Storm and Sansa. One comes from LinkedIn, another one from some other big company. Uh, I haven't used any, any of them. Uh, I know Sansa is more for stateful stream processing. 
So those are uh, another two options. And then the only uh, engine that I, I like to talk is Apache Bean. This was released by Google based on the uh, Google Cloud data, data flow. I provide some way to separate all these things. So basically, the, a big, big problem that actually many companies have with Spark is because it's a Scala based, they need Scala developers, which they cannot find or they are too expensive. Uh, data scientists, they are using Python. So Spark had to build uh, a layer on top with uh, called PySpark, which is not as efficient as Scala, runs a lot slower. Uh, things like that. Um, uh, and basically, these companies, some they use Go language. So the first Apache Bean creates a, a front layer with many languages like Python, Java, and Go. So each one can use the language of their choice. And then also um, decouples the backend. So now you, you can run uh, in, in Jarn, in Kubernetes, in, in any cloud provider, and Mesos. So basically, it, you can write pipelines and run it anywhere in any language. So you can write in, in Python, your pipeline, and run it in Kubernetes or run it in Google Cloud. And it's the same code. So this uh, allows a business to basically decouple from the infrastructure and become future proof. Like me, if I now have to start a project, I will use Apache Beam for sure, uh, instead of going to Spark, um, just to be future proof. And also if I want to run Google Cloud or AWS, it makes things a lot easier. We talk about a bit uh, about this is the whole processing. So now we have processed the data. Uh, many articles they don't go uh, about. For me, one of the biggest problems. Uh, you may have hundred, hundreds of jobs. How do you orchestrate all that? All these dependencies. The data orchestration is a cross-cutting process. It, it basically it's everywhere, and you really need to make sure you have a way to schedule, reschedule, replay, monitor, retry, and debug your uh, debug your whole pipeline, right, in a unified way. So some options that you have in the Hadoop world, you have Fuzzy, which is, is, is for batch processing, right? And uh, it's, it's mainly uh, the Hadoop main scheduler, but it doesn't have many capabilities compared to Apache Airflow, which is the most famous uh, orchestration engine. And again, the orchestration means that uh, it just doesn't know about the data, it just orchestrates tasks, which is a really good thing uh, because uh, you don't want to leak information to the orchestrator. That's a really bad pattern and see it everywhere where the orchestrator be, uh, absorbs lots of knowledge about the pipeline. So if you change something, you need to change your orchestrator. Uh, I've seen many companies building their own solutions for that. So I do re really recommend using Airflow. What I really like about Airflow is that your dependencies is you're not using a YAML, you're not using a UI. I, like others, you're actually using Python code that you can test, you can run locally. Right, you can integrate with your development workflow, with your Jenkins CI CD. It supports SLAs, alert, alerting, um, nice UI. It's really, really good. Uh, and uh, also more modern um, frameworks that try to overcome some of the problems of Airflow. One is Duxter, which uh, is actually also a data flow. So it's basically Airflow plus uh, data management. So it's more similar to NIFAS and since it tracks the data. So it allows you uh, to materialize values. So as you process uh, one step of your pilot, so I'm gonna normalize my data and, and remove null fields or things like that. So that job could actually return you the count of things that it done. So basically it, it allows you to track the data, provides versioning and a lot more. It's a bit uh, immature at the moment, but it, it, it's very, very promising. Prefect is another orchestrator similar to Daxter. Um, it basically uh, provides uh, solutions to the limitations of Airflow. You can read them uh, about them there. And again, as I mentioned, knife, a knife I can also orchestrate. So in short, our orchestration is super important. If your uh, requirement is just to orchestrate the independent tasks uh, that do not require, require to share data, use Airflow, uh, if possible, it's not OOSI. And if you're uh, for data flow applications that require data lineage, you can use NiFi if you don't have the uh, developers, right? Because it has a nice UI or Daxter or Prefect for developers because they are Python based. Another thing that I don't see anywhere is about data quality. Um, like most of my job is trying to find, fix issues. Uh, again, will you deploy code to production without test or code review? Uh, probably you don't 
probably, you know, the answer. I've seen many companies that just don't look at the data at all. They do the test like they do software, right? So they do functional testing, basically a black box. So I put the input to get the output, but most of the bugs uh, are not catch with this and process like BDD or TDD, they don't work for this type of data. So this is quite complex. Um, and uh, this type of process often get ignored and not implemented, right? So testing data is much more complex, right? And so for example, things like, okay, today we have received 10% of data in this table. How do you find out about that? Um, this is very common. Or some value basically um, got, we are receiving too big value, doesn't fit into a int, and now we are getting negative values. Or uh, another issue that I've seen in the past, like we had ACA, and suddenly we get lots of data because the marketing decide to create a big event. Uh, some back in the code start doing back pressure and dropping messages. So we get uh, we're getting data less data for months, and nobody found out. And let me tell you that if a customer finds issues on your data, it really uh, it's it's really really bad because it's, you lose trust on that company, right? So the customer could end up your contract. Um, if you have a regulatory project, you could get huge, huge fines. So it's very, very important you trace your data and you test your data, right? You need to, to, to know, the, check the volume of the data, the value of, uh, of certain columns, uh, have dashboards, checking every round of your pipeline. So, uh, and, and this trait uh, to solve two problems that I see. The most common is misunderstood requirements. This is internally, happens all the time. Developers, they are not business analysts. They do some transformations and they misunderstand some requirements. And then the, 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 it goes to production and there are issues and to uh, fix these are very, very expensive. And then the whole data validation that we talked that is very hard to detect. Um, so, uh, how we can solve this? One, one option is Apache Griffin. It's part of the Hadoop ecosystem, provides a DSL where you can add assertions for your data. So for example, this column cannot be null. Uh, this table have to have uh, X amount of rows each day. Uh, it's integrated with the Spark. So it's basically a Spark job that runs as part of your pipeline and notify you if it finds some issue, right? So basically testers and business analysts can write these assertions, but the problem is it, it's quite technical, right? So for me as a developer, I would really like a business analysts to be able to test the data, right? Uh, I do think unit testing like the uh, ETL, like your process, your functions is not that useful in, in data pipelines. And we, I would like business analysts to, to test the data assets, you know, how the data evolves and is changed, right? Uh, Apache Griffin really helps with that, but again, it's too technical. So another solution is called Great Expectations. I've been following this project because I'm really big fan. It's, it's a tool written in Python and focus on data quality, pipeline testing and quality assurance. And it, it can be integrated with Airflow. So again, you, you have your DAG set of dependencies, uh, things changing, and, and basically every time you change data, after that you run the validation step, right? And the way the um, um, great expectation work is it's basically like a Jupyter notebook. You write uh, your assertions and it's able to translate uh, those assertions into basically language English, right? And it shows in a nice dashboard and you, you can automate this. So basically um, you write uh, Python as assertions that BS can write, but then uh, generates a UI and you can run it as part of your pipeline, right? So it, it provides that full automation, but also this uh, also very human readable um, uh, assertions that analyze VAs and developers uh, can understand and it serves like the data specification. So for me, if they give me this um, um, great expectations notebook that has documentation in plain English, it has the assertions, right? I see the transformations I need to uh, do, the initial um, data and, and the end data. I, I know how, I know what I need to do. Plus I can take that actually integrate it in my production pipeline. So you can go to the website, uh, test it. Uh, really recommend looking to this project. Uh, for me, 
probably the people talk about this park for me the, the one of the biggest project is great expectations because writing a code for a data pipeline is easy uh, making sure that your data is, is is correct is really really difficult and this tool really really helps okay so now we got to uh, sorry I, I know we start late um, but we are almost done so now you have uh, your data so how do you query I'll try to go here. This is a huge, huge topic, um, and it's not very related to Scala, so I'll go fast. But there are a wide range of tools uh, that you can use. Each one has its advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons. Uh, most of them are focused on OLAP, again, uh, but there are some optimized for OLTP. That's the thing to um, consider. Sometimes, uh, basically, then result uh, of your data processing pipeline. It's, it's a OLTP system. So for example, it's Purify process a huge amount of data and then you want the app to, to get that data fast. And others are all up more for dashboarding reporting. Uh, so use standard uh, formats and focus only on, on running queries uh, where others has their own format. We'll talk about this. Uh, the idea is to push the process into the source. And, and some are optimized for data warehousing, star schemas, and so forth, and uh, others are more flexible. So lots of options. These are considerations, uh, and we'll go really, really, really quick through them, right? The first thing you can do to query your data is your, use your, oops, use your uh, processing engines. Like, uh, let me go back. Um, yeah. Uh, so Spark has Spark SQL, uh, Apache Flink as well. Uh, they provide a way to do ad hoc queries, right? So you can use Spark SQL, uh, provides a JDBC interface. You can connect Tableau, Looker, any other BI tool and make queries, right? Um, but you need, for example, a Spark cluster that is continuously running. In the cloud, you want a Spark, running to, a Spark cluster to be created, run, and then finish because they're expensive to run. And then you have typical query engines, right? So what I call query engines is tools that uh, focus on querying different data sources and formats in a unified way. So the idea is to query your data lake using SQL, like if you use a relational database, although the data is not relational under the hood, right? So, so some of these tools can also join query from NoSQL database that you know they don't support joins. Uh, and they provide a JDBC interface, uh, so you can connect your BI tools as well. So th this type of tools are the slowest of what I'm showing, but they are not, they reply in a few seconds, but provide really flexibility. I add there Apache Peak, which is not a SQL engine and uh, is now not used much anymore. So the, the two uh, contenders here are Presto and Apache Drill. I haven't used Apache Drill in details, but I heard really good things about this, especially because it supports fully standard SQL, does not something that many tools use. So meaning that you can use, connect it to Tableau and, or Click or Excel even, and uh, query your, your data in your um, deep storage system. So here, uh, you know, I assume that you have all your data in parquet format in your data lake and you use these tools to connect and provide like a database interface. Presto was created by Facebook. I, I use it many times. It's really useful to, to, to run uh, interactive, uh, interactive analytics queries and it, it could join data from Hive, Cassandra, relational databases uh, and prefer queries in really large data sets. So this is uh, the simplest option. You just plug Presto on, on your data lake and you can query it. Uh, for OLTP, again, um, you have your data in your data lake. HBase provides a database, but it's eventual consistency. So Apache Phoenix is a project on top of HBase that provides more OLTP capabilities to the ecosystem, right? And again, you may use a massive scale database as, as outside of the ecosystem for OLTP, like Cassandra, SilaDB as well for OLTP. So, uh, want instead of putting your data into HDFS or S3, you may put part of your data in, into one of these massive databases, or even if you have the budget, all the data uh, in, into Cassandra and you don't need to use the file system. Okay, uh, another thing, uh, of course, is the search indexes. Uh, actually, part of the process sometimes uh, is to process the data to then uh, be able to access it really easy, especially if you write APIs on top of your data 
um, you want uh, flexible APIs to help consumers to um, fetch that data. So many um, webinars that I've seen, they, they talk, okay, you process your data, you put it somewhere. So if you put it to Cassandra or MongoDB, then you write your web applications. If you put it to a data lake, you connect Looker or Tableau and JDBC, perfect. Uh, but a much more efficient is, is actually use Elasticsearch or some type of invert index search capabilities um, on top of that, because with Cassandra, you don't have joins, uh, MongoDB either, there are no SQL. So the APIs that you can get is just give me this or, or that, right? But you cannot really do searches. So what I really recommend is uh, uh, to put Elasticsearch on top of that and put part of the data there. So the pattern is basically Elasticsearch is like the super fast storage layer uh, that you could put on top of your HBase or Cassandra, right? It, it, it's better uh, basically to use a database like that, uh, which, you know, HBase or Cassandra provide very limited search capability uh, due to the lack of joins. And then you have Elasticsearch to, uh, for your APIs to do searches. Elasticsearch is through the list of IDs, right? And now I can go to Cassandra and fetch them or go to HBase or, or even uh, go to my data lake and do a lookup. So really, really important on your um, data pipeline to have Elasticsearch there. People think about Elasticsearch for DevOps and local aggregations and so on. Uh, but actually for big data, it's also a big, big player. Also you have Kibana for analytics, provides machine learning. Uh, Elasticsearch is something that you really need to, to consider. Plus it has a really good Scala client to uh, write really, really um, good code. And uh, now we go to OLAP. So we, we talk about OLTP with HBase or Apache Phoenix and uh, um, Elasticsearch. Now you want to do reporting and uh, uh, dashboards. So what options do you have? Well, Apache Hub is the way to go to store uh, data in a central schema. It also is the key metadata store for your Spark job. So it really integrates with Spark um, uh, and it leverage uh, on other engines to, to, to run the query. So Spark can be, I mean, Hive can be used as a metadata store for your schemas, right? Spark uses like that, but it can also store data as well. Um, but most of the time it's used mainly for a metadata store. And uh, Apache Impala is, is, is another OLAP engine that uh, for Hadoop that I haven't used, but it's, it's, it provides really great capabilities. Uh, it uses HBase and HDFS for storage. Uh, here are, are two more uh, OLAP engines. They are, you, you have to do your research in my article. I, I find more details. But one thing I really want to focus is in killing because it's extremely super fast data warehouse for Hadoop, for your HDFS. Uh, it, it, it's, it provides, uh, you know, by writing these cubes, uh, which are multidimensional tables, uh, it can pre compute lots and lots of values and really uh, speed up the queries. So you get them in milliseconds, which is something uh, amazing for this type of data. Uh, and then let's go to all up engines. This is the next level. So you have uh, all, uh, basically you have query engines that basically they go to uh, different data sources. Then you have uh, all up uh, databases that is basically a data warehouse on top of Hadoop uh, with a star schema. And then you have these engines that is they are like all in one analytics platform, right? You can ingest data directly into these tools, right? Uh, so they are, they are basically a hybrid of the previous two categories, uh, adding indexing as well, like Elasticsearch. Uh, they live outside of the Hadoop platform, but they are tightly integrated. Um, again, this case you typically skip the processing phase and just directly data in, in, in this tool. So you avoid all these issues we were talking about, cleansing the data, ingesting, orchestrating. They, they can take care of everything for you. So they, they try to solve this big problem of querying real-time historical data. If you use a Spark streaming and Spark batch, you can join those data sets, but there are huge problems on that. Um, and also things like Flink, you can do window operations, but ideally I want to, be, and this is the, the key of LinkedIn, for example, how 
it's able to give you as you post something you get analytics on your post how many people view it right away it's super fast like uh, other um, tools like netflix or even spotify they're a bit behind in the sense that spotify you get your list every week right so how does LinkedIn managed to do these things well. They use this tool, right? Uh, and they are able to query historical and real-time data almost immediately. And the way it works is playing this article is, is really amazing. But the idea is to keep the new data in memory uh, and then slowly in the background move to deep storage. And so as soon as it arrives, the data is able to um, query and not only query but do aggregations on that data. Uh, really, really interesting technologies. Uh, again, what they have in common with these tools that I'm going to talk about is the unified view of data, real-time and patch ingestion, indexing. They all use their own data format, so they use columnar, columnar format, but not parquet, but a more optimized version. It, it, they have SQL support and, and, and multiple integrations. So Apache Druid is the most famous uh, thing. I think it was released by some of the big companies. I don't remember which one now. Um, and it's focused more on time series data. Here there's a lot of information, so I'm not gonna go into uh, this, but it can ingest a lot of data. Um, it, it has a REST interface, but also provides a SQL interface through Hive. Um, it has a metadata store, provides lots of optimizations uh, on your data, so the way it comp compresses data is amazing. And then it has a nice UI, you ingest your data and it's ready to query. And if the data is arriving in real time, you can query that as well and do aggregations of that. Especially doing aggregations at that level is, is amazing because most of my job in the last few years is actually ingest the data, clean it, do some transformation and then focus on how to aggregate data on Spark because that's really important for the business. And this tool provides a way to run a query that aggregates lots of data and you don't need to pre-process this as part of the pipeline. So basically pipelines become almost super simple thanks to Apache Druid or Apache Peanut, which is released by LinkedIn and that's the secret um, um, on your LinkedIn feeds. Similar to Druid, uh, it's really advanced and ClickHouse is written C++, similar tools. Uh, what I'll be a bit careful about this latest technologies I'm talking about, they are really new, right? But uh, they solve a very specific problem. You know, uh, this one peanut was released by LinkedIn to solve their problem. And if you look at the GitHub uh, repo, it's open source, but it's mainly LinkedIn employees to meaning that if you have um, exactly the same problem, then use it. But if you want to make changes, uh, make sure you have your part of a large organization that have uh, enough uh, power to actually contribute to the open source project. Uh, the summary of all these tools, well, if you can wait a few hours, uh, then use bad processing a database like Hive uh, or, or um, to store your data, uh, to query it, so basically, Again, we process all the data, we will land in parquet, and then we can put it uh, if, if in another storage like Hive or Tahoe as well. Um, use killing to uh, accelerate your all-up queries. So if some of your queries are too slow, you can put a subset of data there. And if that's not fast enough and you need real time, consider these new engines as well. So we, we, we are done. So um, just a few notes on Scala. Again, Scala plays a major role in the big data world. Uh, Spark, again, is the most used processing engine. Uh, it's great in Scala. Um, for Scala developers, I really recommend the Spark Dataset API, but just be very careful because it provides similar operations like map, filter, flat, map. But the way Spark works is completely different, right? You need to understand how uh, the Catalyst engine as part works, how it optimizes the queries and so on. Uh, so knowing Scala is just a tiny, tiny bit of what you need to write good Spark code. Uh, Flink and other tools now also support Scala, but Python is also a major player in the big data world. Uh, and many Java APIs have um, Java uh, Scala wrappers as well. For me, uh, my recommendation for Scala developers is to also know Python, to understand Jupyter notebooks that are a way of many data science and BAs give you the requirements. 
Uh, so to communicate with the VAs, uh, Scala developers should know Python, also to write quick scripts. Part of a big data pipeline I see is that sometimes you have this um, small static data and things like that. So you end up writing small uh, Python scripts or a small red service, and you don't want to go through uh, use Scala for that, right? Scala is expensive, so check the pros and cons before introducing to the organization. I'm seeing many organizations that go with Scala because yeah, let's go with Scala. And then um, they have many problems hiring people uh, and uh, also becomes expensive because if you hire, you need to pay them compared to a Python developer, right? For me, Python has nothing to envy. Like they have engines like Faust, which competes with like a string. Uh, they have the, the Dust engine that can scale Python applications uh, enormously. It's, it's really, really good. And, and, and Python for me, compared to Scala, they are both really good languages. Uh, apart from the Scala is much more rich as a language and uh, I, I like it 10 times better, but in the end product, uh, you can do it in, in many languages. Okay, so this is the last slide. Sorry, it took me too long, uh, but the conclusion, again, we have talked a lot about data. So to summarize, we talk about the different data shapes, formats, how to process the data, where to store it, and much, much more, right? Remember, it's critical that you know your data and you know, know the business model, right? Use iterative processes, start building your data pl platform slowly. Not, again, not by introducing new frameworks, like let's use Spark, Cassandra, and choose uh, the framework first, but actually by asking the right questions and looking for the best tool that gives you the right answer, right? For me, it's that important. What business problem are you trying to solve? Uh, review the different considerations, like we talk, uh, choose the right storage based on your data model. Again, if your data is relational, use a relational database. If your data is graph-based, use uh, Neo4j or another one, right? The infrastructure and the budget. The budget is super important because it, if I have all the money, I probably uh, I won't use a data lake, right? Uh, why to store? Why do I need to store the, my data in HDFS if I can have a huge Cassandra cluster, right? But that's very expensive, right? Hadoop provides that uh, cost-effective way. I, if you are in the cloud, remember to engage with your cloud provider, AWS, Google Cloud have their own solutions and teams. Evaluate your cloud offerings, uh, again, buy versus build. Um, again, it's very common to start with the serverless analytic pipeline in the cloud and then uh, move slowly to open source solutions. Uh, that's something I've seen uh, uh, very often because serverless is awesome to start with, but they tend to be quite expensive. Like to run a Spark cluster using AWS Glue, for example, is very, very expensive. Um, data ingestion uh, is critical. Again, though, it, it, for me, it's the most common source of issues. Your data doesn't arrive properly or you have bad data. Uh, it's due to the dependencies on the system outside your control. So try to manage those dependencies and create rela reliable data flows to properly ingest data. Remember, again, to add metrics, log, traces, and track your data, enable schema evolution, and make sure uh, you have uh, set up the proper security and governance on your platform. And finally, again, use the right tool for the job. Don't, don't, don't take more than you can chew. Uh, if you need uh, all up uh, batch analysis for ad hoc queries and reports, again, use Hive, something simple or presto, don't go into this uh, crazy complex technologies like Druid, which is very hard to set up. Um, and, and that's it. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed. So now I'm, I'm ready to take questions from anyone, have discussions, uh, whatever you guys think. Well, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can, um, because there's not that many of us, like I, I suppose you could just, um, Obviously, you un unmute your mic if you if you want, or you can you can pop a question. Any questions that you might have in the in the chat there. Cool. So thanks for that. Have you? This is Rory here. Um, there was a hell of a lot in that. I think I've got a million questions, so I just need to pick one. Uh, no, but have your that that was absolutely brilliant. Um, Lots of great information there. Um, so, so, so thanks for that. Um, about 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, you talked about um, 
the, the the first stuff you talked about with data ingestion and the Kafka and Kafka streams and stuff like that, I think the slide said something about using Kafka Connect or something to do with um, grouping or connecting your uh, streams and topics and stuff like that. If that's the case, what uh, what's that strategy or um, or why would you go down that path? Um, I guess I'd need to see the slide again. <clears throat> uh, yes, I must be. Well, um, I can't talk, I can share again, or maybe I, I just explain to you. It's uh, so imagine you need to ingest data, and, and there's dependencies of that data. Like, for example, you cannot ingest, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, the transactions if you don't have the client data first. So you, you tend to have that thing of reference data, uh, dynamic data. So there are dependencies, right? And so how, when you ingest all this data, like if you can push to your data lake, so if your source systems can push to your data lake, then it's perfect. But if not, imagine you, now you're ingesting and you're pulling data, right? So imagine for APIs or even go to databases or files. So there is a, a, a order, right? So you could have orchestrator that says go here when I finish there, but you need to write all that. What I like about Kafka is actually you can have this non-deterministic approach where you have microservices running and they take uh, the data. So for example, first, uh, imagine the, you need to, I don't know, get first the client information. So they pull all the data and they put it into a Kafka topic. And as the data arrives with the client information, apps that are listening to that topic and require the client information can already start ingesting other data, like one, the transaction, another, um, the products from the inventory, things like that. So you can create dependencies by creating um, uh, basically your DAC, your uh, acyclic graph, as part of your infrastructure. So your Kafka topics become your dependency management. I call it that uh, infrastructure uh, as code. So the way I tend to do it is with Terraform, I, and I create my uh, direct acyclic graph with Kafka topics, right? Or, or in, the, in the cloud, uh, I, I use Kinesis or, or uh, Google PubSub. I, I, this project that I did like that, it was in Google uh, PubSub, where we create dependencies by creating the topics. And we use Terraform, and that's basically a, a, our uh, dependency graph, which uh, data could be processed at what time. Uh, and not only for ingesting, your whole data pipeline could be like this. So uh, your Kafka topics uh, are, are your orchestrator, right? And not only ingesting, the processing could go like that. If I need to process the data first uh, and then do something else, uh, basically this process A will put it in a topic. And then imagine that after processing, there are five things you can do in parallel. So you have five consumers of that topic. If then they have to be merged into a single thing, you put it in a different topic, and then that one has one consumer. So you see how then you don't need Airflow or complicated logic or to orchestrate your pipeline. Can I, Kafka topics, they create that dependency by, by basically setting on your Terraform file which topic should um, uh, you know, the topic and subscriptions, right? Which uh, subscriptions subscribe to a uh, given topic. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I was just uh, curious about the use case, but what you're saying there um, makes sense. Um, yeah, so, so good answer. Thanks for that, yeah. Any other questions, comments? Or if you have like a single question, like, generic question, how would you go about doing something? Let me know as well. Um, Hi, Hi, sorry, it's Holly here. Thank you um, for your presentation. That was awesome. Uh, although I'm not really familiar about everything you're talking about. so. Just wondering, um, in your real work, say, for example, if you have different format of data coming every day and you want to do machine learning, data, analyze, data analyzing and uh, reporting on the data, so, um, how would you build your system? Like what tools you're going to use and why? 
and the, the problem of, of big data, as I said, uh, um, is that you have too many options, right? And so it will depend a lot on the organization, like if you are in the cloud or not, right? So the, the first question, I will go into the cloud, right? And if you mm -hmm. are in AWS, I will tell you, okay, uh, in AWS, it's very easy. You just use Kinesis to ingest real-time data. That's basically similar to Kafka. And then you use um, SageMaker to do basically do your inference of your data models. So you, you use SageMaker to train your models and also to query them. To, to enrich your data. So basically machine learning models are used to, to enrich your data at capability. My previous job, we used machine learning models to basically, it was a news platform. So we will take uh, raw data, which is are actually text data that has no structural meaning, right? Uh, you cannot get insights for text. So we'll get meaning with track entities like this article is talking about Google and Trump. Uh, we'll track sentiment, we'll track the, all these uh, if key phrases. So now you can actually start building get insights about your data. So we'll call it machine learning models in real time as the data arrives from different sources. Uh, basically, in this case, we have Google Cloud. So it, will, it was Google Pops Up, right? So that was our solution. It's a messaging system. So we'll have APIs receiving articles. They put it in Pops Up, and then we start calling our models. And here we have those dependencies. So some models have to run first. So if the article was in a different language, like Russian or Chinese, we'll have our own machine learning model that will translate. So that will have to happen first. After that, we'll have several models that could run in parallel uh, to extract entities, to extract sentiment, and, and we have a, a lot more. But others will depend on, on things like, for example, we'll create clusters of news. So that one has to go, go after, right? So we'll have these topics to create those dependencies. So basically applications will subscribe to a topic and then put the message back. So we'll use basically infrastructure as our thing. So we wouldn't use Airflow uh, to orchestrate the pipeline because the messaging platform was using that. And then uh, in this case, uh, we, in, we decided to use Bigtable. Bigtable is similar to HBase. It's a massive database. For big data, I, I do really recommend, I think uh, Google Cloud is stronger than AWS. Um, it has lots of big, massive databases. So when you are in Google Cloud, you don't tend to use Data Lake as much, although they have data proc and things like that, because they have really databases that are quite cheap and provide lots of data. So we'll install all this data, even if it was text, into Bigtable. Bigtable is similar to Cassandra, right? So we'll install the data there. And then we'll also index it in our Elasticsearch for our APIs. So then you could, you could do queries uh, on your data uh, through the API. So for example, I want news that mention Google and uh, that in English and things like that. And uh, basically, uh, then we'll go to Elasticsearch. It will give us the IDs, and then with the IDs, we'll go to a big table to get all, all the uh, data. So that way, you create that fast storage layer, uh, which is Elasticsearch. And uh, big well, big table is also quite fast. But in theory, if we wanted, we could put the article, the text data, which is quite big into a file system as well, because Elasticsearch will do most of the operation uh, and, and then um, go to a cheaper system as well. And of course, we were running everything on Kubernetes. That was our platform. So we wouldn't use Spark. My current uh, job right now, we use all the Hadoop environments. So we run everything on Spark, Cassandra, uh, and, and Aka. So in my current job, the way we ingest data, is through ACA streams. So we have uh, services that put, uh, call our legacy systems, pull the data, and dump it in HDFS. So we call API, so we dump the JSON there. Then Spark will process the JSON and store the data in a, a common schema. That's the trusted data set. So put it in Cassandra. And from there is when we do reporting layer. So for different and, and downstream systems where we take that data and put it in a different other um, Cassandra databases uh, that are foreign clients. That's uh, so it's pilot is different. I don't few of them and all different. Another one that I work is it was in AWS using Glue, Athena, 
uh, so completely different. That's why in this article, if, if you start and you read it now at home slowly and click the links, uh, you, you'll see all, all the options. But it, um, it, it's very, very tricky. And that's what I focus on based on your company, try to identify the solutions. I see uh, many times that people really go um, overkill. Uh, basically, they, they use technologies that they don't need. Uh, they overcomplicate things, uh, and uh, my go goal with this article is uh, to be able to show you the big picture so you can make decisions a bit easier. Yeah, got it. Thank you. And uh, if I want to learn to build my, like, say, a baby ecosystem for data extraction, analyzing, and reporting, what kind of environment you suggest first? You can use the cloud. Um, I, I would suggest to start your big data journey uh, to start with Google Cloud. It provides uh, 300 euro free credit where you can spin a, lo a lot of things and uh, query APIs. It has the best machine learning capabilities and you can do uh, lo lots of cool, cool stuff. I see LinkedIn and Twitter people building really uh, nice things with the 300 euro that Google Cloud provides. So really open an account and then uh, you can actually, they have these tutorials where you can go, okay, I want to ingest this data of, uh, I don't know, for example, um, this um, taxi ride from New York, for example, they have lots of um, things and then you can uh, process that, add machine learning, call some models to try to predict behavior then save it somewhere like um, it has Google uh, Cloud has uh, the best data warehouse, right? Um, uh, uh, BigQuery, save it there, and then you can build dashboards showing you the predictions and things like that. So definitely uh, Google Cloud or, or AWS. If you want to build your own from scratch, you can actually um, uh, use Kubernetes to uh, get an uh, instance of Cassandra and uh, build your Scala applications or Python. Or in the Python world, there's lots, lots of things that you can run on your own machine. Um, there's lots of solutions. There's this, I, I, it's in my article, there's this uh, Faust, a library for data streaming in Python. Uh, I don't know what's your preferred language, but uh, especially Python is, is very easy to get started to machine learning data ingestion and everything. Yeah, thank you. Great, so, um, oh, sorry, I, like, I think I could, yeah. I comment then for Wardia about uh, Azure. Um, yeah, Cosmos TV, I think, is the equivalent in Azure of DynamoDB, a uh, really good NoSQL database. Hyperscale, I don't know, maybe it's the Spark version. What I notice about the cloud providers, they copy each other, so eventually they, they all tend to converge. The only one a, a bit different, I think, is Google Cloud that has certain databases that others don't have. But, you know, this thing, when I see sometimes recruiters say, oh, we need a Azure architect or a Google Cloud. And at the end, they are pretty much all very similar. The, you can find equivalents on, uh, they all have a NoSQL database, a SQL database, so they are quite similar. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. Um, just cu curiosity is, is, is biting here. Um, you mentioned kind of proof of concepts and stuff lately. I'd imagine in your career to date, you've been working on a lot of proof of concept stuff to actually touch on all of the technologies you're talking about because to get that type of experience is, um, it's, it's, it's kind of pretty hard. Even if you're working on a new data lake or a new analytics platform or whatnot, to actually get to play with, play with everything is, is kind of tough. So um, again, yeah, lots of great information on this talk. Thanks. Yeah, just uh, one thing to mention. That, yeah, I, I did a lot of POC. Unfortunately, most of them, it's hard to get into production, but I managed to get uh, uh, some of them. And so I, I got to uh, play with different technologies. But in the article, I, you know, when I wanted to talk about the Spark or Flink, which are engines I use, uh, I went, I did research to bring other tools that I haven't used. So I haven't used everything I use in the article. I mentioned that a bit, 
uh, I just put that as reference. Even after writing the article, I made lots of changes because actually CTOs or sales from other companies say, you didn't mention my tool or you didn't mention mine. And uh, it actually become, the article grew and, and uh, became like one place to mention everything. So I got a lot of feedback and uh, I add things so, uh, from um, other companies that uh, they, are, um, they still have solutions on the big data world. It, it looks like like that's it. Um, oh yeah, I just want to say a massive thanks to Javier for for that talk. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and obviously thanks for all the the like in depth answers um, in the Q and Q and A as well. Um, apologies for getting this. I know it's it's gotten a bit late now. Um, apologies for the the mess up um, in getting everything everything started. I promise for the next one we'll have everything sorted uh, beforehand and we won't have to be sending links and stuff really late but thank, thanks very much to Javier and um, obviously everyone that joined I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as I did and yeah thanks I thanks Eric too nice. well done cheers thanks very much bye bye thanks guys bye bye